I studied the brain in love. I and my colleagues, Lucy Brown, Art Aaron, and Bianca Acevedo, have now put over 100 people into the brain scanner to study the brain circuitry of romantic love and attachment. 17 were people who were happily in love, 15 were people who had just been rejected in love, and 17 who were people who were in love long term. Then, in the year 2005, uh, Match.com, the internet dating site, came to me and asked me, why do you fall in love with one person rather than the other? And I said, I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, we do know that um, you tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic background, same general level of intelligence, same general level of good looks, same religious and social values, uh, reproductive goals. But you know, you can walk into a room and everybody is from your background, same level of intelligence and good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So that drove me to wonder about the saying, you know, we have chemistry. People will say, well, we have chemistry. And I thought to myself, maybe we have some biological makeup that naturally draws, up, draws us to some people rather than others. So I began to look into the biology of the brain to see if I, I could find any trait at all that was linked with any biological system. I found four the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen systems. They're all linked with a different um, uh, constellation of personality traits. So I created a questionnaire to see to what degree you express those traits linked with each one of these biological systems. And I put that personality questionnaire, there's 56 questions on it, I would have liked to have left them on your seat so that you could take it too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it's now been taken by 13 million people in 40 countries. And indeed, I can watch about um, 30,000 people take it every week. And I can watch uh, who's naturally drawn to whom. So for the next um, probably 25 minutes, um, I want to tell you the short story of the brain in love and why we fall in love with one person rather than another and end on some of our newest data on happiness. In the jungles of Guatemala, there stands a temple. It was built by the grandest sun king of the grandest city-state, Tikal, of the grandest new world empire, the Maya. His name was Casa Canchao. He stood over six feet tall, he lived into his 80s, and he was buried beneath this temple in or around 720 AD. And Mayan inscriptions say that he was madly in love with his wife. She died young, so he built a temple for her facing his. And every spring and autumn, exactly at the equinox, the sun rises behind his temple and perfectly bathes her temple with his shadow. And in the evening, the sun rise, uh, sets behind her temple and perfectly bathes his temple with her shadow. Some 1,300 years later, these lovers still touch from the grave. Around the world, people love. They sing for love, they dance for love, they compose poems and stories and ballets and operas and movies and plays about love. They retell myths and legends about love. They have love charms, love potions, and love magic. We, are, we pine for love, we live for love, we kill for love, and we die for love. It's one of the most powerful brain systems that the human animal has ever evolved. As a matter of fact, the ancient Greeks called it the madness of the gods, and indeed it is. I think that it is one of three basic brain systems that evolved from mating and reproduction. One is the sex drive, craving for sexual gratification. Uh, W.H. Auden called it an intolerable neural itch. That's what happens. Uh, it's associated with testosterone in the brain. It can have no object. You can feel the sex drive when you're just walking along uh, in the street, reading a magazine, uh, driving your car. Uh, it can be focused on a whole range of different partners. The second of these three brain systems is romantic love, the one that I study most. Passionate love, obsessive love, being in love, infatuation, no matter what you call it, I'm going to maintain that it's linked with a different brain system, the dopamine system. We've heard a lot about that this morning. I'll say a little bit more. It's focused on one person. Uh, in fact, uh, George Bernard Shaw, once he, he defined love as he said, um, love consists of overestimating the differences between one woman and another. And indeed, <laughs> we do. <laughs> and the third brain system is attachment, that sense of calm and security that you can feel for a long-term partner. 
uh, associated by other, with other scientists' work uh, with oxytocin and vasopressin. I think these three brain systems um, evolved for different reasons. I think the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. I think romantic love evolved to enable you to focus your mating energy on just one at a time. And I think that third brain system evolved to enable you to tolerate this human being at least <laughs> long enough uh, to raise your children together as a team. <laughs> There's very many complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, complicated ways that these three brain systems interact. Uh, you know, you can fall madly in love with somebody, and three weeks ago, uh, the guy was just a nice guy in the gym, and all of a sudden, everything, even the way he moves his hands, everything becomes sexually attractive to him. And this is in part because. Uh, with romantic love, you're driving up the dopamine system, and the dopamine system has, a, uh, has a, um, a positive correlation with the testosterone system, and it, it soups up the testosterone system, and boom, all of a sudden that person is very sexually attractive to you. And of course, uh, the reverse can actually also be true. You know, um, you can casually go to bed with somebody and all of a sudden fall in love with them. And it, is, it doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. And it can happen because as you're driving up the testosterone system with the sex drive, you're triggering the dopamine system and you can, you can push yourself over the threshold into falling in love. And also, uh, with sex, uh, with orgasm, there's a real flood of oxytocin linked with feelings of attachment. So casual sex is not casual, um, unless you're so drunk you can't remember who you were screwing. You, it's not so, you, you, uh, something is going on in the brain, and Justin's going to say a good deal more about that. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is, these three brain systems are not always connected. You can feel deep attachment for one person. You can lie in bed at night and feel deep attachment for one person and then swing into feelings of wild uh, romantic love for somebody else and then swing into feelings of uh, the sex drive for somebody else. Uh, it's as if there's a committee meeting going on in your head as you see, as you swing from one brain system to another. And of course, all of this evolved. It evolved along with an enormous number of... Um, of complex mechanisms uh, for mate choice and for love and, and attachment. But the one I'm really going to talk about now is romantic love. There's a lot of uh, traits of romantic love. Um, first one is what I call special meaning. A person, uh, one person wrote once, she said, the world had a new center and that center was Marianne. You just focus on this person. You can list what you, I, before I put people in the brain scanner, I would ask them, you know, what do you not like about him or her? And they could list what they didn't like about him or her, but then they swept that aside and just focused, just focused on what they adored. Intense energy, you can walk all night, talk till dawn, euphoria when things are going well, mood swings into horrible despair when things are going poorly, real bodily reactions, uh, awkwardness, stammering, uh, butterflies in the stomach, what a bad deal. You know, the, the one moment you want to be your coolest and you can barely <laughs> cough out, uh, you know, how are you this evening? It's just, uh, you're, you're overcome actually, probably with a norepinephrine response. Um, a real emotional dependence. Uh, before I put people in the, I'm an anthropologist, not a psychologist, and I, uh, so interviewing these people wasn't totally normal for me, and I've gotten used to it, but the most difficult question for me before I put them into the brain scanner is, would you die for him or her? And a good number of them would say, yeah. They would say yes as if I had asked them to pass the ketchup. They were just, just you know, willing to die for another human being. Real separation, anxiety, uh, um, frustration, attraction. The more you can't get them, the more you like them. We now know some of the brain circuitry of that. Uh, very well said by the ancient Roman poet Terence, who said, uh, the less my hope, the hotter my love. We now know the brain circuitry of that. Intense sex drive, uh, um, uh, jealousy, possessiveness. Uh, anthropologists call it mate guarding. Uh, uh, probably our world's crimes of passion all come from this tremendous drive to protect uh, this individual that you love. But the three basic emotions of romantic love are intense craving for emotional union. Yeah, you'd like to have sex with them, but what you really want them to do is call, write, tell you that they love you. Uh, obsessive thinking about them, somebody's camping in your head, 
and intense motivation to win them. Indeed, to win life's greatest prize, which is a mating partner. And last but not least, involuntary. Stendhal once said, he said, love is like a fever. It comes and goes quite independently of the will. And indeed it does. So I thought that I could put these people into a brain scanner. And um, we began. My hypothesis was everything here in red are traits that are linked in one way or another with the brain's reward system, with the dopamine system. Um, um, obsessive thinking is probably linked with low serotonin, bodily reactions with the norepinephrine system, sex drive certainly with the testosterone system, maid guarding perhaps with the vasopressin system, and all kinds of combinations of all. No system in the brain works all by itself. But the bottom line is I thought maybe I could find people who were passionately in love and put them into the scanner and begin to convince the world that this is not part of the supernatural, that it is part of a profoundly basic brain system that evolved from mating and reproduction. So I began to do it. Um, this was a, a cartoon. <laughs> New Yorker got onto our thing and can't get two people into a scanner. This is what a basic scanner looks like, I'm sure you know. But nevertheless, we got them into the machine and we got them out and we found a lot of activity in a lot of different brain regions, but most important, we found activity in a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And it's the brain region, <clears throat> little factory, that actually makes dopamine and sends it to, to, to many brain regions. It's the brain region linked with, with wanting, with craving, with obsession. And when I saw that, and I also found activity, and we just got, this is the first time I've ever been able to say it, we found activity in the nucleus accumbens. This is, for 10 years I have waited to see if I could ever find this, and we finally found it a couple months ago. Nucleus accumbens is linked with addiction. I've all long maintained that romantic love is an addiction, a positive addiction when it's going well with the right person under the appropriate circumstances, and a perfectly horribly negative addiction when it's going poorly. So we've found that. And indeed, when I saw this data, I finally realized something. You know, you heard a lot this morning about the emotions. Um, I'd always felt that romantic love was an emotion. Uh, perfect, you know, I mean, or a whole group of emotions from high to low, low. And there are a lot of emotions involved. There's a lot of cognitive processes involved. But what it really is, is a drive. It comes from primitive brain regions, low, uh, way below the emotions uh, associated with wanting. And in fact, I read a lot of world poetry. I think it's a great artifact of the human mind and how the mind works. And of all the poems that I have ever read, I think love is best defined by Plato in the, um, in the symposium when he said, um, the God of love lives in a state of need. It is a need. It is a homeostatic imbalance. It is a craving. It is an obsession. It is an obsession, as I said, to find and focus on and win life's greatest prize, which is a mating partner. Here's one of our scans of the ventral tegmental area. Uh, and um, I'll just, I think it's stronger than the sex drive. Uh, uh, you know, if you ask somebody casually to go to bed with you, uh, you don't, uh, and they say no, uh, you don't kill yourself. Uh, and around the world, people really do kill themselves and others or stalk or slip into clinical depression uh, when they have been rejected in love. So. Uh, I think it evolved a long time ago. Uh, these are some people living about 3.2 million years ago. Uh, the newest data on Ardipithecus ramidus, 4.4 uh, million. Uh, I think that um, by then, there's various uh, features of the face, uh, uh, which is too long to explain, that indicate by then they were beginning to form pair bonds to rear their young. Uh, not necessarily sexually faithful to those pair bonds, but forming pair bonds to rear their young. And indeed, along with that, I came. I think the uh, the uh, brain circuitry uh, for romantic love uh, began to develop in the human line. I think it's very, very old, very primitive, very primordial. And if we were to live a million years from now, I think that brain system would still be with us. So, can it last? Well, most people don't think it can last. And um, so we began to decide we were going to put older people into the brain and into the scanner who were um, maintaining, telling us that they were still madly in love with their partner. So um, we did that. The first author 
uh, is Bianca Acevedo, Lucy Brown, our neuroscientist in the middle, and me. And sure enough, among people, they were all married an average of 21 years. They all had grown children. They all telling us that they were still madly in love, not just loving, but in love with their partner long term. And we found, we did the same experiment on them, and we found the same activity in the ventral tegmental area linked with feelings of intense romantic passion. We also found activity in brain regions linked with attachment. Uh, and in that way, it was very similar to uh, those uh, individuals who had just fallen happily in love. But we also found something else. Uh, we found activity in a brain region, once again, in these brain regions near the base of the brain, um, linked with, um, uh, uh, with calm and, and pain suppression. And we found no activity in a brain region linked with anxiety. You know, when you've just fallen in love, you are anxious. You know, I mean, what did I say that for? How come I, am I too fat? Why didn't I do that? What is he saying here? You're anxious. And all of that is now gone in long-term love. So, why do you fall in love with one person <laughs> rather than another? <laughs> this was the question uh, that MASH.com came to me with. And as I said, uh, I know timing is, is, is important. I would even add at my age that lighting is important. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, certainly we do tend to fall in love with somebody from the same socioeconomic and, uh, background, same level of intelligence, good looks, uh, uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. Childhood always plays a role. Uh, but I wanted to know if your biology uh, played a role too. So I looked through all the biological literature, it took me a couple of years, went through the last 40 years of it, and I found four brain systems, as I mentioned in the beginning, each one linked with a constellation of personality traits. And this is, I, I created the questionnaire using those personality traits. Now, I'm not talking about types. We all have all four of these brain systems and many others. In fact, I recently, uh, with a scientist um, uh, from um, Princeton, a geneticist, we looked at 100,000 people who took my questionnaire, and no two people answered that questionnaire the same way, which is exactly what I had hoped for, as I've never met two people who I thought were alike. I'm an identical twin, and even we are not exactly alike. But we found patterns. We found patterns to how they took the questionnaire. And here are the patterns. First of all, I decided I had to name these people. So my academic names, those who were ex particularly expressive of the traits linked with dopamine, I called curious energetic. Those um, linked with serotonin, cautious uh, social norm compliant. Those who were scored very high on the testosterone scale, analytical tough-minded, and those who scored high on the estrogen and oxytocin scale, uh, pro-social empathetic. We're all a combination of all of them, as I say, but we express some more than others. So here are the, the four. And then, of course, I was able to watch who's naturally drawn to whom, because I knew the, what, the answers to their questions on the questionnaire and then watched uh, who they're drawn to. So the first, uh, oh, I had to name them. For, I work with them, uh, uh, an internet dating site. You've got to have a regular name. So I call them the explorer, the builder, the director, and the negotiator. Not good terms, but I'm stuck with them now. So anyway, um, those who are very expressive of the dopamine system tend to be uh, novelty seeking, risk taking. Academics called it sensation seeking. They're curious. They've got the most interest. Uh, interest. I would guess there's a great many of them in the room. They make the most money and they lose the most money. Uh, <laughs> um, they are, are explorers, uh, physical and mental. Optimistic, actually I think um, Obama is very much of this category. I was very amused the, the night that he won the election the first year, The Onion, the humor magazine online. The big line said, it said, black man given worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still optimistic about it. <laughs> Uh, energetic, independent, impulsive, uh, unreflective. Um, I'm one of them. I'm unreflective. And matter of fact, I was making a speech to a pile of therapists. I do talk to a lot of couples therapists, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't really care who I am. And some guy in the back of the room, he screamed. He said, you want to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, uh, mentally flexible, open-minded, uh, much more likely to be a Democrat, uh, uh, much more likely to live in the state of California, particularly the North. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of data for the country. I should have put that data in there anyway. 
Um, but their main thing is they are curious. Idea generation is linked with the dopamine system. A good example is Richard Branson. Uh, you know, um, he has the urge to live life to its full. This, the explorer does. Uh, another person is Lang Lang. I don't know if you've ever heard him, the pianist. Dazzling, flair, charisma, bravado, daredevil. is just a wild guy. Magnificent on the piano, but you can see that dopamine just <laughs> seeping out of him. <laughs> um, and these people are drawn to people like themselves. I've done studies with, um, with 30,000 people uh, twice. <clears throat> and... Um, <clears throat> Um, and, and curious, creative, energetic people want somebody like themselves. Uh, the second um, broad style is those expressive of the serotonin system. Uh, their main thing is they observe social norms. They follow the rules. They like the familiar. They're cautious. They're not scared, but they're cautious. Uh, they tend to like routines, plans, schedules. They're orderly. Uh, persistent, they're very literal, they like the details rather than the big picture. Uh, they're very good with math, uh, on average, um, important for them to belong. It was interesting because I think it was Susan this morning who was talking about how we are all um, eager to belong. Some people are more eager to belong, and I do think there's a, a genetic uh, component to that. They respect authority, follow the rules. They're religious. Uh, religiosity is at least in part in the serotonin system, and this is why if you are taking, I don't know, ecstasy or, or LSD or one of them, you're driving up the serotonin system, and this is why people will have a religious experience. So I'm told. Uh, <laughs> I'm in California, whatever. <laughs> uh, um, and the oddest thing about them is the thing about loyalty. Mathematically, it is so stuck with this system. One of my questions, it's something like, I never remember the question, but it's something like, have you, um, would you rather have loyal friends or interesting friends? Well, we all want loyal friends, and we all want interesting friends, but these people cannot tolerate unloyal friends, and the other three types cannot tolerate uninteresting friends. The real <laughs> distinction <laughs> between these types. Um, a good example is Meg Whitman. Holy smokes. Uh, I, I <laughs> and even more so is Mr. Bromney. Um, and once again, this type is very drawn uh, to people like themselves. Traditional, conventional, social conforming, uh, is drawn to people like themselves. The other two uh, are drawn to their opposite. Um, high testosterone type tend to be analytical, logical, uh, spatially skilled, um, inventive, experimental, rank-oriented, um, something called dominance matching. Uh, they will attack and they expect you to attack back. And if you don't, they think that you're weak. And as a matter of fact, when I work with a company, I'll say to somebody, attack them back. And um, when they do, it actually works. But of course, if it's your boss, you know, you've got to consider this sort of thing. But um, uh, they're emotionally contained. Uh, I have a girlfriend who said to me recently, she said, she said to her husband, she said, um, you know, you haven't um, told me that you loved me in a month. And he said, well, I said that last month and nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> they're also decisive, bold, and direct. These are the ones that say get to the point. Uh, Steve Jobs is a perfect example. Also, his face is very high testosterone. The heavy brow ridges, the high zygomatic arch, the cheekbones, the very square jaw, and the high forehead are all linked with uh, testosterone. Uh, perfectionist exacting. And Hillary Clinton. Um, certainly, women can be very high in testosterone. Uh, when asked uh, why she was attracted to Bill, uh, she said, he wasn't afraid of me. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and the last of the four broad systems are the estrogen oxytocin system. These people see the big picture. It's because of the way the brain, the architecture of the brain, uh, they tend to be uh, contextual, holistic, uh, long-term thinkers. Very imaginative. A very interesting article came out this past week about imagination, and it once again showed that it's the kind of brain that's very well connected with all kinds of uh, uh, systems and gear at the same time that gives you that imagination. And in fact, I would say that women are, on average, somewhat more imaginative than men because they do tend to have this more globally connected brain. Uh, there's many traits that men have that women don't, too. Uh, I've been very, a, a, a sort of a lone voice of one to try and explain to the world that women, that men fall in love just as much, uh, um, etc. But anyway, um, uh, these people, both men and women who 
are expressive of the estrogen oxytocin system. They're linguistically skilled, um, good at picking up postures, gestures, tone of voice, very good at what was they said this morning, theory of mind, getting into somebody's head and figuring out uh, what they're thinking. And they can be very um, empathetic, is linked with the estrogen system. And what's interesting to me about this one is the word trusting. Anthropologists haven't really known why the evolution of trusting. I mean, if you trust the wrong person, you're really uh, out to lunch. But if you trust the right person, you actually save a great deal of metabolic energy. And you can begin to see how all of these traits will go together. You can't be trusting unless you can get into other people's heads and, and read what they're thinking, etc. So you can begin to see how the evolution of a host of traits will, will evolve uh, together. Uh, they tend to be introspective. You know, Freud once said, a cigar, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. No, not of these folks. Everything means something. Just the way you cut that orange in the morning for breakfast means something. Um, um, they seek harmony. They're not any nicer than others. They'll stab you in the back instead of hit you in the face. But the bottom line is they, they seek harmony. They become agreeable, emotionally expressive, and have a diplomatic intelligence. Oprah Winfrey is, I think, uh, one example. I think Bill Clinton is, is another example. Uh, you know, he's the one that cried at their daughter's wedding, uh, not his wife. Whole world knows he can't stop talking. Uh, <laughs> and, as a matter of fact, you know, people have wondered when, you know, when we're going to get our first female president. I think we've had our first <laughs> female president. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, Charles Darwin, a brilliant man, a wonderful combination of the dopamine and the estrogen systems, connected more things on this planet than any scientist or anybody before or since. So, um, uh, this week, I hope my academic article will come out in a really fine journal in which I've put uh, two groups of people into the brain scanner, had them take my personality questionnaire, and we are finding, we are mapping the brain circuitry of these four broad styles of thinking and behaving. So I will just go on to say, what makes a happy relationship? What has all this data shown me and others about happiness? And uh, I had a lot more to say about this, but I'm only going to say one thing. It was a, um, uh, a study that we did in China. You know, when you do brain scanning studies, you've got to do them over and over. You can't just do one study and have anybody believe you. So one person in our lab uh, went to China and did the first experiment over again, the uh, one of people happily in love. And um, three and a half years later, and we found exactly the same thing in the brain, and three and a half years later, they went back and to find out um, whether these couples were still together. And indeed, half of them were together, and half of them had now broken up. So we went back and looked at those original brain scans to see whether the people who were still together had some sort of brain architecture or function that the others did not. And we found activity in a little factory in the medial prefrontal cortex in the blue there. And that brain region is linked with suspending negative judgment, over-evaluating your partner. And when Lucy, my brain scan scanning partner, came to me, she says, well, look what we found. We found this area. And I said, that's positive illusions. That's what academic um, psychologists call positive illusions, the simple ability to overlook everything you cannot stand about him and just focus <laughs> on what you do. And indeed, these seem, this seems to be a brain region that is linked with the ability to have a happy long-term relationship. So I'm going to close with this. Um, this is not the only um, thing we're going to find. Love is the most important thing that we do with our lives. If Darwin were here today, he would end up saying, you know, if you have four children and I have no children, you live on and I die out. The game of love matters. It is a basic drive that evolved millions of years ago, and along with it are going to be all kinds of myriad different brain systems that enable us to pick the person that's right for us. Thank you. Thank you.